Definitely. Let's definitely talk. And uh, I got some good feedback on this. There's people who are who've actually stopped me and said I really like the. So all two people. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people end up watching it later. Um, well, yeah, I, that's the way it should be. Yeah, and the the one piece of feedback I'm, I'm getting pretty consistently is you need to speak closer to your mic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what I hear what I want to say anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, Derek Chauvin case. Guilty. Yeah, on all three counts in a short amount of time. Boom. Huh. You didn't see that coming. Did not. I had that one. <laughs> I dead called it. Wrong. I was dead right on this one. I'm like, he's done. Well, and it makes it makes me nervous. So, um, and this whole this whole conversation is gonna make me nervous because there's a lot of there's a lot of potential landmines to step in. Um, well, we should bring it back to the Bible at some level. That's a good idea. <laughs> Why would we not? <laughs> <laughs> Just as a reminder. <laughs> this is one of the Christian podcasts. Yes. Yes. Two pastors. Yeah. Main things. God. Yeah. What should we? Yeah. Um, we'll get there. We'll get to Romans in, in a in a hot second. But let's. Um, so here's here's kind of my thoughts on it. Um, on the one hand, I feel like it was a morally. This is what I told my son. My son asked me about it. I, I think it's a morally just reality that he's going to go to jail for a super long time. And I hope, we haven't gotten a sentence in yet, but I hope it's a super long time. Yeah, what's the max? Oh, I think it's like 40 years. 40 years, and but he has a lot of other ones, but they usually serve them concurrent, so it usually ends up being the longest. Yeah, I don't know but I'm guessing, the details. I'm guessing he's going to have good behavior in prison? I would think so. I would yeah, think so. Yeah, there's, there's ways to get out earlier. So why do we put people in prison again? Yeah, I don't think we should. So there's only uh, uh, punish, right? Uh, stop them from hurting other people, right? Is there another reason? Yeah, they they say it's usually not a rehabilitation. That's what they say, <laughs> serve your time, you're rehabilitated, ready to go back into the senior dent to society. Yeah, people come back worse and they yeah. leave prison ill-equipped. It's not Shawshank good. Redemption. Yeah, it's. <laughs> Well, and, and they usually have just learned more, like have a, a more criminal mindset. Having so, I, I mean, I to survive think, prison. Yeah, there's other ways to punish people. Yeah. I mean, just beat the crap. Out Romans of didn't do it. Day. They had no prisons. Yeah. The Roman Empire is like, we can't afford these things. Yeah. We're either we'll put them in jail for a little bit. We'll put them on trial, and they're either a, they're innocent, or we're gonna kill them. Yeah, pretty or, much. Or beat the snot or out beat of the snot out of them or something. That happens. Yeah, I mean, they, they, but they're like, we're going to execute this thing because we're not, right. we're not going to have a prison system. Yeah, and and to do, and it became barbaric. But. We we imprison more people than anyone else in the in the world. Yes, per capita, it, by a long shot, like a wide margin, which is a, its own strange thing. But I mean, keep in mind, we also then don't do a lot of things that other countries will do, mm-hmm. um, which is. You know, I actually just recently looked this up: Black and African Americans, thirty eight percent. Of the, um, let's see here, would be the, I guess the, uh, not the, uh, in Des Moines, actually, I do this for our stats class. It's yeah. about a 27 to 30% kind of arrest rate, mm-hmm. where the population is only about 7%. The U.S. population, I think, is about 12 to 14%. Yeah. And so, essentially, they have, like, triple the death rate from police. Yeah. yeah. They have about triple, all those stats get about tripled for that group. Wow. Now, what's interesting is I have lots of st- – we're doing projects and stats. A lot of them are picking this topic. It's so interesting that they, they choose it, and so they dig through and have some good data sets and stuff. And what I think sometimes blows them away is like, oh, no, no, no. A majority of cops killing people are white. Mm-hmm. Like 60% or 65% oh, people killed. killed by cops oh, are white yeah. because they – represent the highest percentage of the population so it's that ratio it's that proportional reasoning which is what i'm trying to teach in math right but um so sometimes it gets blurred like oh no 90 percent of people being killed by police are black like no 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 it's still the minority right it's a disproportionate amount right and what is that and and so that's always a very – it's a great conversation to see, like, wow, the Z-score and the probability of this not being – of this happening by random chance. The Z-score. <laughs> it's crazy high. Clear dork. I know, but <laughs> this is the way – what what I would love – what I uh, when I hear educated people talk about topics, they speak statistically. Yeah. 
Yeah. They understand it at some level, and I can pick it up. I'm like, okay. But a lot of times I'll hear a politician talking, and I'm like, oh, you don't understand stats at all, do you? Uh-huh. Or, or they do, and they are dismissing them <laughs> yes. and twisting just them. Just the their vernacular. So way. I just had a conversation with a student yesterday about this. She's calling in, asking, hey, could I study this? But like gym memberships or yeah. whatever it was. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. And we're having a conversation that talks this way. I'm like, yes, you're becoming an educated person. Uh You are learning things. And now you're asking critical questions. What's the bias? What's the sampling method? Is it representative? Mm -hmm. What are the potential errors? What's the alpha level? What's the p-value? All these things, right? So they're like, it's great to watch these 18 to 23-year-olds. This like, And so they're asking really good questions. And they're thinking really well. Uh, That's fun. So whenever I see any statistics about prison, cops killing, all those, I can't not jump to those questions. Right, right. As I'm trained that way. Uh And that's what I would want everybody to do. Uh And there is going to always be bias. Well, yeah. The question is, can you lessen it? Right. And there's no way you can ever remove it. And will there never be error? There will always be error, even in the, like, so we're going to prison. Mm-hmm. There's going to be error in the system. The question is, what types of errors are we okay with? Yes, and, <laughs> and that is why. I mean, I'm there. Is my stats lesson? Yeah, we are, I'm a I'm a bit opposed to. I'm not like super strongly opposed, but I'm a bit opposed to the the death penalty based off of that. Mm-hmm. That it's not you can't undo it and you can't make up for it. I mean, it, there is no uh, backsies. There's there's no do overs. Um, but. I think that there there are times when it you know could be used. Except that I you know there's also this thing in, in the Constitution about cruel and unusual punishment. And I, like I said, I think it's I think I've said this before on this podcast. It is both cruel and unusual to die because I've never done it. So and nobody's ever done it more than once. Or kill people, right? That's except for Lazarus. Lazarus did it more than once. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, back back to my thought on the case. So you don't think he should be killed. Uh, well, I don't, but I, but I also don't think he should have been convicted on at least two of those charges. Because you said there was a reasonable doubt. Yeah. That there were some other contributing factors. Yeah. By, by rule of law. Mm-hmm. And especially in the first Ooh, one. Can I go back to the stats thing here? Because this is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so reasonable doubt is the standard. Yeah. Okay. So in statistics, <laughs> distribution, middle is innocent. Reasonable doubt. That means that... How far from innocent do you have to get the burden of proof out before there's no reasonable doubt? Since how many Z scores or what's yeah. the probability that you're wrong with right, this decision? Right, right, right. So criminal court is extremely high, what we call alpha level. The probability of you making a type one error, which means you're innocent, but I'm going to call you guilty. Very difficult for that to happen. That's okay. a type one error. Make it easier for what we call type two errors, which means <laughs> I say you're guilt, you're not guilty, but you really were. Mm-hmm. That happens all the time. Yeah, we're okay with type two errors. Right, we're not okay with type one errors. We, those make TV shows. That makes making a murder. That mm-hmm. makes Dateline. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but that's what I think you're talking about. If the reasonable doubt, that alpha level, the potential of sending someone to prison. Are we going to be okay with sliding that back? Right. Is the burden of proof not needed to be as much, or is it only for certain types of cases? Right. And is there a bias in the system of the sliding scale of an alpha level? That, to put it in statistical terms, is that what you're talking about? Yes, and that is an interesting <laughs> thing. Is, is, is that reasonable, bo- reasonable doubt able to be scaled to a particular case? I mean, I think we would all want to say no, but then we get and we get a. But what's the consequences if we don't do this? Right, but if, exa- <laughs> it, well, and if, if you know, in in a specific case, in a in a unique, critical moment, this, this is what I, I keep coming back to: is we're looking at um, a chronic problem, mm-hmm. but we're only dealing with the the one-off crisis event. Specific events. Yes. Which is really all we can. That's all the the law as far as the judicial system yes. is applied to individuals, which is why statistics should never be allowed in a court of law. Right, right. I've had to tell lawyers that. Really? Defense lawyers uh, for the state of Iowa. Oh my gosh. I'm like, dude, you let them say that four out of five pedophiles repeat offend, 
You can't say that in a court of law. You just used a statistic and tried to apply it to a dude. Right. You cannot do that. It's describing populations. Right. I'm like, you idiot. Yeah, and there's no <laughs> there's no way to say that he is the not the one out of the five. I mean, it's... Yeah! I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> I wish everybody had to take stats. How about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> and do really well on it. So I think that the, the murder two charge, I, I didn't understand that. He had to be intentionally committing a felony and then also have killed him. And I don't know what the intentional felony was. I guess that it could have been that, uh, I think what, they, what the state tried to say was um, it was an assault. And I don't know how it can be an assault if he is acting as a police officer who is, who is legitimately arresting somebody who's been resisting, like all of these things. I go, I, I don't know if that, he may have, unintentionally be committing a felony, but he had to intentionally. So I, I already go, I'm not now, sure. About I saw that. an interview with the lawyer, yeah, the district attorney. They asked him, why didn't you charge him with a hate crime? Because there's no evidence. Because they didn't have any evidence that it was racially motivated. Yeah. Yeah. And then and the whole, like, and that, it bothers me that a lot of people are treating it as though it is a hate crime. It, there's no evidence it was a hate crime. Like he, like if he would have had a bunch of social media posts that were, yeah, and, you know, or something, some witness, some, somebody they could have brought in. He's like, we didn't have any, we didn't have any evidence, so we couldn't charge him. Right. But the, but it, but all that set aside, <clears throat> um, oh, and, and uh, like the, the other part of the reasonable doubt is the real question about his health and how, uh, the the officer couldn't know a. I mean, they, I'm pretty sure they knew he was high. Yeah. Uh, he had like three times the the level of fentanyl in your system that could kill you. Oh wow. Um, yeah, that's could cool. kill you. See, that's that's another sliding but scale he's a, too. He's a big guy, big dude, and and um, there's not to disparage him, but he's been using fentanyl for a while. So, so he's some resist. Yeah, tolerance. He's big. But there's a lot of fentanyl. And analogize it to alcohol, right? Right. I used to have a golf partner, big dude. He literally probably could never get drunk on light beer. <laughs> like he couldn't probably get fit enough, enough in his gut at one time because right. he's a big guy. He's got high tolerance. Right. The alcohol content's really low in mm -hmm. light beer. And I, I, there used to be a, an app you, or a website you could go to. Put in your body weight. Have you had food? Yes or no. How many beers per hour are you having? At what point will you cross the limit? So I put his data in there <laughs> and I'm like... I don't know if he could physically do this. <laughs> he had to have seven beers an hour. I know he had had some stupid amount, which is why he never drank beer. Right. He drank hard liquor because <laughs> light beer is like water to this guy. Right. That's funny. So um, I don't know what the fentanyl yeah. that, uh, app is, but, <laughs> but he had so he had fentanyl, he had, he had meth, and he had some heart issues. But and, I, and I've said to people before, it, it's not a uh, easy one to one because if if you put me face down handcuffed and what Derek Chauvin did to him it, for nine and a half minutes wouldn't kill me. Because you have a super strong neck, which you got to prove. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I did get to prove that. Because <laughs> you fell and hit it. <laughs> right. And it saved your life. It did save my life. The, yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, but that's not a fair comparison. Should we, tell, we should tell that story. Yeah, we should tell that story. All right, pause. <laughs> pause, this is a good Oh, awful story. It is. It, it's. I believe that this was God's hand at work for your benefit. <laughs> no, it was not for my benefit. At my it cost. was. It was and a, your detriment and your family's detriment, <laughs> yes. and it made you. Yeah. It changed you a little. For, for a bit. I'm saying it changed you a little bit. Because <laughs> so. you had to look death in the eye. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. legit. Like I could have just died. Like, yeah. I can't. See, I've ever had an experience like that. It had to change you at some level, didn't I it? I feel like that, though. I know. Okay, maybe. <laughs> so, but well, anyway. You're getting more mature, Luke. <laughs> that is true. That is true. You're maturing. <laughs> and I would like to say it's because I'm helping you. <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> yeah, right. Because yeah, you're the yeah. most grown up I know. <laughs> <laughs> so mature. So yeah. the story the story is, uh, no, I actually do think it was for the benefit of the church, too. Um, you were... Super new. I mean, this was Gene. Yeah, I've only been around a couple months. Yeah, like it, we just called you and installed you, pretty much. Nope, it was, wasn't even then. Really? It was pretty, bef before? It was January. I think it was April when I got installed. Oh, so I bet. Yeah, I think you were called. I was helping out. Yeah, you were called, but not installed yet. Yes. I think. Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't think installed. You, I think you had the call. Yeah. So I only been a couple months. I had, it was January. Going to the gym. Uh, get to the gym. 
Sunday, this is back before COVID, so the gym was open at 4 a.m., which is when I like to Nobody should be at the gym at 4 a.m. on a Sunday. <laughs> I'm so, sorry, it should be illegal. So I get to hop out of my truck, and I put my feet down, and it was icy, and I just went, zwip. And I have a, um, it's not technically a running board. It's like a rocker or something else. I forget what it's called. But it's, it's designed, it's a big, beefy steel thing that's designed to, like, drive over, like, so you don't get hung up on rocks and stuff. Feet go off from under me, and I hit right at the like the base of my head, the top of my oh neck, my. on the the bump on that feet in the air, head down, yeah, right? Just whack, and I out cold, gone, right? I wake up, and I I can't get up. I I mean I I can move. I can I'm, I check fingers and toes, but it it hurts so bad. My whole upper body, like my my shoulders, my traps, my neck, and my head hurt so bad. I, I couldn't hardly sit up. I was I was stiff, and and it kind of started to get up. It was a below bit. zero. It was below zero. <laughs> and <laughs> you don't know how long you were laying there. Do not. Uh, there were there was another car in the parking lot. Somebody walked past me. <laughs> and this, did they stop and check no, you? I don't think so. <laughs> if they did, I don't know. Oh, it's just Luke. <laughs> <laughs> he looks fine. <laughs> So I go into the gym, and I'm thinking, what, what can I do? So I tried to stretch it and roll it out a little bit, not helping. I sit in the hot tub for a little bit, not helping. And I'm <laughs> Nobody like, gets in the hot tub. Yeah, I'm just, I, I can't, can't get it to loosen up, and I can't. I, I can't turn my head. I can't hardly move. So I hit, hit the elders with a text. Hey, guys, I hit my head really bad. Um, I got to go to the hospital. Um, just the church is on you. <laughs> this is the only time I've ever this has ever happened to me. I've never been too sick or too anything on a Sunday morning to go. So I contact you and I was like, "Bro, I can email you some notes, but I had your notes." Yeah, I was because like, I was going to do children's message that Sunday. Oh, that's right. And that was when I was asking for those notes because I really screwed those up so pretty much every like, time. It's on you. Ready, set, go. You're mm -hmm. preaching a, a cold sermon. Yeah, I think Jason texted me. Yeah, or something. And so I got here about an hour uh -huh. before service and had to prep your sermon. And then, so the, the deals had to come pick me up from the hospital. The, the best part is Joni just went to church. So I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go to church. Because <laughs> she was like, whatever. <laughs> she, she was thinking it herself. She's like, I can't, I'm not going to do anything if I go to the hospital with him. And he's not going to want me to do nurse. <laughs> she is. And she's... She's just my wife. Like, she knows. I'd be like, I don't know why you're here. Like, you're not doing anything. <laughs> Go home. So, um, but then I'm, I'm there, and they, they start talking to me about the the where I hit it. They did all of the CAT scans, x-rays. It's also nice to go to the ER at 5 in the morning is there's no one there. <laughs> so, like, they're like, uh, CAT scan, yep, go. <laughs> there's no line. <laughs> like, x-rays, go. No line. Just doing all these tests, and they said that the way I hit, oftentimes where I hit, they have a, a, thing, a thing called a hangman's break. And that is where they would align the noose so that doesn't take too much to just snap, snap the neck and you're gone. And I had to go back for more images like a week later to make sure that you didn't break your neck. That there wasn't a, like a little, a little crack in there that later on Fracture. can snap. And they flat out told me that it's it's because of the the beefy neck and the the traps that like, that saved your life from from surely dying. And the other really weird like thing you needed a reason to justify your lifting. <laughs> right. The, yeah, right. <laughs> the really interesting thing is so so the deals come to to pick me up because my car because I drove myself to the hospital <laughs> of course, um, which was really interesting because I couldn't actually turn my head to look both ways. I had to just kind of like ah drive. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you drove yourself to the hospital. I drove myself. And then what they do when you got there? They put you in like one of those halo. Oh, I had the whole yeah whole <laughs> thing. It was I had to wear it for a couple of days. Um, but I, <laughs> so I start. Joanne comes in. She's like, "Are oh, you okay?" And I just yeah, I just started because you got concussed. Which and I thought I didn't put the two together, but like over the next couple of days, I was an emotional wreck. And I did like a little Google you were, search. You were so nice. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like one of the potential side effects of getting a really bad concussion is is um, a change of emotions and personality. And it, it can go like, it could turn into a really mean person, always angry. And I, I just got turned into the sappy, weepy, dopey guy. 
mellowed. And I, I had to say in church, <laughs> I have to tell you guys something. If I start crying, I'm sorry. It's not me. It's the, the head thing. I'm not. So I did. I, I cried like the next two Sundays in a row in church. I just like praying for somebody who's sick. I'm like, is this, this, this? <laughs> so so stuff they're told. I just feel so bad. <laughs> was, but it, it took about six weeks total. It was it was the worst at about two and a half weeks, and then it faded down. But I would I'd sit on the couch. We'd be watching a show on Netflix, and a commercial would come up that was, you know, like it's like you're pregnant. Yeah, yeah. It was so I'm just, just crying. Like this is the worst. Oh my gosh. So how'd that benefit our church? I, I still not, I'm still not catching this. Because all of a sudden the church was like, I mean, they, they, we had another pastor, and it was like they were like, this is why a potential reason why it's good to have two pastors and for you to step in and, and it was Dan can do this. Dan did a nice job preaching that Sunday. It was it was everybody kind of collectively went. I never want to do that again. No, oh, yeah, and I, I also <laughs> no, don't not, ever want to do that. This is not doing that again. Jeez, that was a rough one. Yeah, oh. that, that was. I you were I do remember having that conversation with you like you you were like oh I got a lot of kids mm-hmm. and I got a wife and uh, if I wasn't here what's that look like uh-huh. I remember you you're like oh this is I was never more happy that the the people I had gotten I, I have uh, my insurance through Thrivent my life insurance through Thrivent and they just did the whole like mapping out of of all of this life insurance and here's what you're going to need for all these kids blah 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 so if i die it's like it's like a one point well, two beyond the money or they need you yeah no i know but I like know, i was like, never so glad in my life to have. i had that taken care of i was like dude <laughs> there so we're like you know dave ramsey good some term life insurance yeah. if you haven't so yeah far. it's cheap <laughs> it's super cheap and if you're young man it's I got, really cheap i got some stupid life insurance oh, wow. <laughs> My first policy I took out, the guy was like, you're in great shape and you're 25. Our wives so. are like, you guys are better off dead. My wife has us. mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Um, <laughs> back, to the, back to the Shalvin case. So it's, it's one of those things where I, I want the, the law to be applied uniformly because I get nervous if we, if we turn into a thing that says. Ooh, equally or equity. No, that's a different <laughs> podcast. Trust me. It's the same thing. Well, equal outcomes versus equal opportunity. Right. Same thing in the law process. It is, it is actually very similar now that you, that you said that. Equal it, outcomes or yeah. equal in a, application of the process. Right. But if, if we start to try people and, and just say, well, what is the public opinion versus the details of the fact? That only works as long as the public opinion is in your favor. Mm-hmm. Is and, that To Kill a Mockingbird, is it? A good book. Yeah, that, that is a good book, actually. That was a game changer book, cultural changing mm-hmm. book. Um, but that 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 troubles me just a little bit. And I, like I said, I, I don't know that. How did that trial not get moved? See, that's another thing. And the the jury wasn't sequestered. Yeah. And then you've got um, why were they not? You got politicians popping off the mouth and and people saying we're gonna. Get louder, more confrontation. See, I'm worried they're going to get, oh, we're going to have an appeal now. We're going to do this thing again. I th- I think for sure that's going to happen. Ah. And I think this time on appeal, they can try and move it. Uh. And I think some things are going to get overturned. Uh. And I think that's worse. But Because I actually think that the jury may have heard, oh, they popped off at the mouth. All of these things are there. The judge said you may have a reason for appeal. So... Let's just convict him on everything and let him appeal. And then it's not... Because all those jurors, imagine that. Like, if yeah, you say, their names aren't being released for six months. It's been yeah, ordered. and in six months, if they, if they had said not guilty on any of those, in six months, their houses would be burned down. There's a good black mirror on this. There is a good black mirror in this. Remember, remember they, that... Oh, it's, it's chilling. Yeah. So some awful human being does an awful thing mm-hmm. in the court of public opinion, right? So they actually have like a theme park yeah. where people can go and essentially punish this person. They drug him. He wakes up in this kind of Hollywood set town, and he realizes everybody's out to beat him up and kill him and yell at him. And they kind of do that. And mm-hmm. then they, don't they like essentially drug him again or kill yeah. him? They just keep doing it. And then he wakes up the next day and he has to do it again uh-huh. and again. And he, that's his punishment is mm-hmm. perpetual public anger and public persecution. And, like, that's chilling. Mm-hmm. 
but that's I think that that's what made me think of it's like are we moving more in that direction right like we're taking it out of this sphere of mm-hmm. the the state has been called to execute justice right. in this particular way and manner and then uh, are we sliding it into the court of public opinion yeah and, and my biggest so I also fear that if this feels like a win I don't think it is because it's not we're, we're, we're addressing an acute case and acute cases similar to uh, <clears throat> excuse me where I do feel like there, there needs to be some police reform, but the real problem is why are why are um, so many black people and, and brown people so upset? Because the statistics you were mm-hmm. saying earlier. Yeah, they don't lie. Three times more likely. The real question is, why is that community? <laughs> yes. And it's and it's, this is not a blame the that community. Mm-hmm. It is what things have we put in place and this is where you actually can talk about systemic racism and people misapply that all the time yes systemic there are systemic things that have put people of ethnic minority backgrounds in impoverished places and situations that then result in higher crime mm-hmm. which is going to result in higher arrest rate which is going to result in a in a higher rate of incarceration that's in a sliding scale of what is legal and illegal Drug legalization is a perfect example of how that has changed over time. Now, what if the controlling ethic or moral of the society does not match this, right? So we have this, so if you're in a nihilistic, perpetual um, situation where the dominant dominant culture is life in and of itself has not as much value, right? Like, Like... that's a nihilistic way of thinking. Now, our culture as a whole doesn't have that. Right. But do we have situations where that exists? The answer is yes. So this, there's a disconnect. There's a, they're not matching. Right. So now you write a law based on the whole. This is what we believe and value, and this is the laws we're going to write to help do these things. Great. Oh, but that's the opposite of what's going on over here, mm-hmm. and it's gonna, it's gonna end up being a disconnect yeah. between the two. And there's going to be conflict. So the <clears throat> an example could be uh, as easy as uh, cocaine versus crack. It's basically the same thing. <laughs> um, one of them is a lot less expensive, so the people who use it uh, are tend to be more impoverished people, tend to be more people of color. And we decided that crack cocaine was, uh, the use of that was uh, a greater penalty. So rich white guys who like to do coke <laughs> before their business meetings, they get caught and it's a fine and you're kind of in trouble. But then like an impoverished person of color uses crack recreationally and they go to prison for 10 years. You're kind of libertarian, right? I'm a bit libertarian. Yeah. yeah. So you'd be like, yeah, just don't don't do that. Just make let people make their own decisions. I would invest in getting people off of drugs. <laughs> In, instead of arresting and because they don't get clean in prison, no, <laughs> they get more drugs. I, I've had people tell me it is easier to get drugs in prison than anywhere else, because everyone's there's a dealer. A, there's, there's a market. <laughs> yeah, and everyone's a dealer. <laughs> yeah. uh, Does anybody in here know where I could buy some weed? <laughs> Everybody's like, <laughs> literally everybody here. <laughs> this conversation. Oh, it's like, oh, it's a really good. There's a little documentary called The Big... This guy in the Northern California. It's these pot growers. There's some murders in the early 90s. That Bigfoot... Have you seen this? No, but I've heard of it. Yes, but it just... And it, didn't they blame it? They blamed it on the, Bigfoot. Th- that's his nickname. Oh. But they did frame Bigfoot. Like, they put this... Like, they ran over the bodies, and they, like, put footprints around, and they brought a meth head, a little meth head out to witness it, who they knew would tell the story to everybody else. And that's, like, Bigfoot killed these guys. I mean, that's how that happened. This guy did a documentary. It's just... I heard about it. But it's all these, but it was all these pot growers in Northern, right. and, and they're trying to, like, it's a turf war, and there's power struggle, and, and, and so it, it kind of is the drug culture that's behind the story of Bigfoot. Yeah. Which is just a very interesting. It is very interesting. But there's... Good entertainment. I mean, there's there's so much we need to be doing to assist those communities to be communities where um, the, the culture shifts away from these things that uh, end up being policed and, mm-hmm. 
and, and we can change our culture, like the whole culture of the country, some, mm -hmm. in my opinion, too. But it also needs to be local stuff. But that's that's the real – see, that actually takes – a long time. Yes. It takes energy, it takes mm -hmm. focus, dedication, commitment, and these are things Americans don't have. <laughs> we 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 the have expediency and no attention span. I mean, as soon as something happens, we're all like bah, and then it, we move on. We like crisis, not chronic. We love a crisis and, and hate, hate chronic. chronic. And yeah, nobody wants to, nobody wants to do the chronic work for their health. Or just give me a pill. Yeah, Isn't just, there a shot for this? Like, yeah. can I just move on? <laughs> Literally, coronavirus. It's like, it was, I read something there was. Um, so there's a, a study coming out that it dramatically reduces your um, the the effect of coronavirus on a large population of people if you have higher levels of like vitamin D, uh, magnesium, or something else. Like Sunshine. A, a couple of things. Yeah, it's just Heat. Like, take take some summer. Vitamin D. Summer helps. Yeah, just take some vitamin D. <laughs> Why aren't you taking the medicine? I. Uh, I heard a guy, a, like a national public health guy, this morning on TV, mm -hmm. and the, the interviewer goes, can I stop wearing my mask outside when I'm by myself? <laughs> he wouldn't answer. He would not give her a direct answer. I was like, tell this poor woman she doesn't need to wear a mask when she's outside by herself. Or was she trying to set him up? No, she was very really? genuine. She's like, can I not – because she – you can tell she's hypersensitive to the issue. Like, yeah. I'll do whatever you say. And he just, every time she would go down, he would go another way. I'm like, come on, tell this woman she's fully vaccinated. She doesn't know, she's wearing a mask out when she's outside in the park. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I know common sense should reign here, but please tell this woman this common sense. He wouldn't do it. Because I think he's afraid to get on record that he said you don't ever have to wear your mask For sure. when you're by yourself outside right. and you're fully vaccinated. Right. I'm like, just say it, dude. Yeah. Like, everybody's so afraid to say that very, very basic, obvious thing, isn't it? Yes, it is very basic and very <laughs> obvious. If now, when I was no hiking one... in Colorado, if we were going to be close to people, like last fall, yeah, everybody's masking up when yeah. you're going to pass each other yeah. on the trail. I just went like this. <gasps> and this guy... <laughs> Pull your shirt just, up. I just hold my breath. I did. I pulled my shirt up a few times because I'd see these people like they'd see you coming. They're masking up. I'm like, well, okay, fine. I'll, I'll do that. I'll I'll go outside the trail. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Downtown, outside. This was a rule in Colorado. If you're downtown, you're masked up because you're in close close proximity. I get it, but oh my gosh, why? I just felt so bad for that woman. I'm like, oh my, she's going to jog in her mask still. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> it is sad. But anyways, the um, there are things that we should be doing differently. I mean, I, I, I do believe that there's a, there's a bit of a case for the depraved heart uh, charge, the murder three that um, Shalom got hit with and convicted on. But I, I think that um, just the, the way he was and the fact that, it, I mean, it seemed so clear that that dude was dying. I mean, just, I, I'm watching. Yeah. I, I know how it ends, of course. So I'm watching yeah. the video, and I'm like, yeah, that's what that's what people look like when they die. That's get, how get off him. Yeah, get off him. There was no reason to, to stay an, on him. What an idiot. Make so, but but by letter of the law. So again, that's where we could change the law, and we we can have things that apply specifically to police officers in situations like that. Mm -hmm. But this is yeah, there's there's things to learn. But if the other thing I'm scared of is. It, with something like this, are police officers going to look at that and go, I don't think by letter of the law he was guilty on those charges. So if this is the direction the world's going, then here's my two-week notice, taking retirement early. This is happening. This is happening. Yeah. And, okay, so I'm a teacher, and I, this has happened in education. I mean, it's been documented. Yeah. Um, a couple generations ago, who were the population of teachers and who was in education? Well, it shifted. They, right now, the average education major in whatever comes from the bottom half of the class. Yeah. Okay. How are the working conditions changed? Oh, are you recruiting the best and brightest to do this? Police could be the same way, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I don't care what you're in. If you're in accounting or you're a pastor or you're a banker or you're a teacher or you're a police officer or you're in the military, I don't care what you're in. We all know there is a wide range right mm -hmm. 
how do you, if this is a super important thing in our society, how do you recruit really high quality people that really want to train and put themselves at risk and very hard vocation? Mm -hmm. How are we going to recruit them right now? Hard to recruit them, I would think. Yes, and getting harder and harder. And so who is going to take the jobs then? The bottom of the barrel. Oh, gosh. And that is not a healthy thing. No, I don't... it is not. It's like pastors. I mean, look at bottom yeah. of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> who wants that job? I mean, you have, to, you have to have a real passion for it. I mean, you know, pastors are, are a great example, actually, because mm -hmm. you get a ton of education, put in a ton of work. And there's a lot of churches out there. We are very blessed to be at the one we are. But there's a lot of churches out there who pay real crappy. <laughs> we just had this conversation and, with yes, the guy did. who knows. And they're terrible to their pastors. And it's like you got to love ministry so much. And at that point, it's not about loving Jesus. You can love Jesus and not be a pastor. It's <laughs> super easy. Most of you are that. Yes. Right? Keep it up. <laughs> um, but it's you have to have this passion for it. You're going you're to have to have people who are passionate about policing. And still also then be bright, intelligent, and, and all these things. What you're going to get are, are people who And deal are, with disrespect. Yeah. And, and people who are going to not... And what we're gonna I was a classroom teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I could see, even when I was teaching high school, and I'm, cha I'm like, ooh, things are changing. Yeah. I just called mom. Oh, she's on junior's side. I'm like, oh, we're... <laughs> okay. I remember the kid. His name was Blaine. I go, Blaine... I can't really tell you what to do, but if you'd be so inclined, this is the activity that I would like you to do with the rest of the class. I got to that point with him. Oh, my word. And I was about in my fifth year of teaching. So I wasn't a noob. Uh, so I kind of knew what classroom management stuff. Right. Stuff. But I'm like, oh, I've talked to your mom. I'm not going to get any support from that principal. I'm not getting support from mom, which means it's just me, and I'm, I'm lost. I'm done. I bet he did really I, well in your class. <laughs> he did apologize two years later. Really? Around a campfire. Which I really appreciated. Huh. But he almost made me want to quit that semester. Oh, well, I bet. But I hear this happening more and more, and I was in a great school. Mm -hmm. I was in a wonderful, I mean, great school. I'm like, if this is great, and this is what's going on, <laughs> what's going on? And I hear horror stories. Yeah, and, and this is, well, there you go. Just like right. police officer. Yeah. This is, I'm policing in Clive, Iowa. Great community. Crap still goes sideways. Yeah, what yeah. about if the, because the government and the policing and the school and the churches are a reflection of the community they come from. Mm -hmm. Period. And there, there's the a government, great... The U.S. is a reflection of the people. And there is, again, the, yeah, the, the U.S. is the people <laughs> it is sometimes we forget that though right oh that's that that official that's the problem like well yeah. he's a reflection of the culture that he comes from and if you think about um so the the, the point you just made about you're in a great school and think about those other schools where are those bad schools at poor communities yes where and who lives there primarily people of color here we so are with community we are. development again. I know, and it. So now we have to. When be, helping hurts. Exactly. We the have Lippin to, Center. We have <laughs> to work hard at changing the culture of those educational institutions. Oh. Um, but but what do we say? And all those markers of measurables of yeah. how, the health of a community. Another great example of, of how this goes so backwards. We say, okay, we're going to give them an incentive to get more money to improve their schools <laughs> by telling them if their scores go up. Then we'll give you more money. So what such those, a Western way of thinking. And what do those what do those schools do? They they fake the numbers to get more money. So they <laughs> literally don't care how you score on these tests. Like just turn them in. We're gonna lie. Like whatever. You're, you're graduating. Not, yeah, yeah. I don't care. You're graduating. Exactly. I I haven't passed a class here. <laughs> like, yes, but if you no. graduate, our numbers are higher, which means we get more money from the government, which means the problem is not solved. <laughs> it, it it gets worse. Mm -hmm. Where is it getting worse? In those communities, so we, we are we are literally continuing to put them systemically more and more behind the eight ball, mm -hmm. and there it is. We we have not yet brought this back to the uh, Bible and Jesus yet. We're going to right now, my man. What's the foundational structure of society? 
What's supposed to be? Well, I was going to say. <laughs> what's supposed to be the foundational societal structure, biblically mandated. This is the way. A moral code? Family. Okay. Okay. I see where you're going. Mom, yeah. dad, procreation, within marriage. Bring them up in the faith, teaching them right and wrong, blah, blah, right. blah. This is the responsibility of, the vocation of mothers, parents, and, fathers. Yeah, mothers and fathers. Yeah. And that, I think, if we, that's the one thing you almost never hear anybody ever talk about in statistical or individual terms is what is the thing that's supposed to be foundational, that's supposed to deal with all these issues that the government is not really designed yeah. to deal with. That is the thing. And when you got 40% of babies being born out of wedlock in America right now, there you go. Mm -hmm. That has changed over the last two generations. And I think you can almost track that with a lot of these other issues. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it is a either a symptom and a cause. It's a, yeah. it's a cyclical thing. Uh, but when you see strong families you normally in all the measurables like we were talking about like the lip and center and stuff if you see strong families you see strong communities right you see strong why is the iowa so good in education it's not because we're smart no nope. it's because we have a higher proportion of families yeah and it's almost like God designed this in a specific <laughs> way. this is so whenever we go away from God's design Right? Sex within marriage mm -hmm. is the design. Good design. Good design. Outside it's of that? Potentially could be... Problematic. Problematic. Society could suffer from it. Mm -hmm. right? So, I don't care what the sin is, but let's just deal with that one specifically. So, if we um, were able at some level in the church to promote marriage and families and sex within marriage, it'd be amazing how much poverty alleviation there would be. I mean, that's like... That's like the number one indicator of someone being in poverty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are are you a single child from a single mom? Yeah. That's like the number one predictor. If you, in fact, uh, everybody's saying it's getting worse from generation to generation. If you control that one variable, okay? When I say control a variable, that means that one is not, we, we've removed the bias of being a single mm -hmm. from a a child from a single parent, if we remove that one, 93% of people in America will go up one socioeconomic status within one generation. That still exists. 93%. Now, nobody wants to say that. That's true. It's, it's, it's been proven. So if, like our kids, we're married, and our kids are growing up in a two-parent childhood. Yeah. Now, Statistically, those scenarios, 93% of those children will be one socioeconomic status higher than their parents within one generation. If you don't have that and you don't control for that variable, that's why the national average is this generation doing better than the last. First time in the U.S. history, it's going the other way. Yeah. And I'm saying... Pretty sure there's something with this family thing that has to do with this. That's my, my neighbor. But that's my huge bias. Right. That's my worldview. That's where I'm coming from. Here's God's design. Here's how we're departing from it. Here's the consequences of right. that. But my my maybe I'm wrong. neighbor, who is uh, is an African American man, loves Jesus. Uh, his whole family is just an awesome family. Lived in L.A. for the longest time. Uh, has done a lot of, or grew up there, so he's, he's seen a lot of inner city urban stuff where he lived and then does some of this out here. He's a um, music minister at a church as well. But he, he told me, he goes, I, in his opinion, and he said there's a lot of data that supports it. I just kind of looked it up. Um, the, the biggest crisis in his community is fatherlessness. Yes, it is. And I, I think it's the biggest crisis in America. Yeah, yeah. Period. But it's, it's much higher. And, and again, let me get back to no, my it's libertarian not. ways here is what are we now as a government looking to do? What is our government looking to do? Give money <laughs> specifically in, in forms of entitlements or whatever it is, but, but payments to single moms. Mm -hmm. So what are we actually... Which in theory sounds like a really awesome thing. We're incentivizing we're, single mother. Which is what the government can only do. It can either say this is bad, this is good, or stay neutral. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you start incentivizing certain behaviors, people will figure it out yeah 
Like right now, I, I've had, I can't tell you how many people I know have said, I need people to, to work. <laughs> I mean, I, one of my buddies, Frank, is um, he's a, a rep for a distributor of, of different alcohols. He's mostly wine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, he goes, I just pulled a, a shift all night and I got to go to work, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what's going on? Goes, we can't find people mm-hmm. to just unload the, the trucks that come in. Yep. Because they get paid more to be on disability. Or when when we were at Agape, employment. I went and got lunch at Burger King. That manager was, I, I heard him out. He was out in the main area talking to every worker, essentially begging them, can you take another shift? Could you go to this other store? They have nobody there. They won't be able to open if we don't get somebody over there for the shift. We're going to have to reduce our hours. I went and got pizza for the youth. The lady at Casey's, the manager, she's like, I'm having to work doubles every day because I cannot find a soul to make a pizza for me. Oh. And I'm my, like, I keep hearing this over and over and my over. Neighbor, so he works for FedEx. I was just talking to him this morning. He just jogged my memory. Um, he said, he told me and my other neighbor out, we put the kids in the bus, we have a little coffee. Uh, I drink coffee, nobody else does. We have a little coffee chat outside. And he said, FedEx just announced yesterday they're hiring drivers in the city. So the city of Des Moines, you don't have to drive over the road anywhere else. Starting pay with zero experience, they will train you up. Thirty dollars an hour. Ooh, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> zero, absolutely zero. He goes, they will train you. You have to sign a one-year contract, a, but after that, they're, you're good to go. You, you wow. can go work anywhere else if you want. But it, we have super low unemployment here. It's crazy. Crazy. <sighs> but then Jesus is going to come back, and everything will be fine. So. Yeah, I've had people texting me that one this week too. <laughs> Hey, can, can Jesus come back right now? I'm like, I don't get to, I don't get to say in that. Did you put a word in there? <laughs> I don't know you want Jesus so you want I, to come back soon. I think, you know, we're two white guys mm-hmm. who know, well, we know cops mm-hmm. and we know African Americans, and mm-hmm. but we're from the burbs, so we will never truly get it. Right. And, uh, I mean, look at us. Don't we look like white privilege? <laughs> we are. <laughs> I know. Right? I mean, I mean, we we are like the whitest guys from like about the whitest state, right? <laughs> right. Right. I mean, and outside, mm-hmm. um, you don't know the heart, and yeah, that's. I think that's what hurts sometimes when you're like, well, my heart doesn't feel like that, but I feel like I'm that thing that people are saying, and again applying group theory yeah. or statistics to individuals should not be that's a really scary awful thing if you're in a relationship with someone and you know them all of a sudden things change things change Your perspective is different <laughs> but i think you know I, I do think it is um and i'm, I'm hoping I've, I've got a couple of thoughts I, I need to kind of flush out with some other people but there there needs to be some sense of um Work something from the church, from from the um, perspective of God's kingdom, mm-hmm. to address some of these disparities. That it's we a have. heart issue. It's always a theological issue. All every problem we deal with <laughs> is a, is there is a sin behind every one of them, yeah. which is why Jesus came to deal with sins. Yeah, and and racism is a big issue everywhere you go. I mean, yes. it's, it's not like there is. We're in Iowa, so there's no racists here. <laughs> That's not true. I think it's funny when you go to other countries and you're like, oh. Super racist. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's. Yeah. And you're like, you know what? Or when I think of like, um, let's say, I don't know, Afghanistan, Pakistan mm-hmm. or someplace. You're like, you got to remember, they've been trying to live like it's the 700s since the 700s. Mm-hmm. And we're only, what, two, three, four, five generations down the road from. Right. Yeah. So it's like. Man, we, it's easy for us to have this really short memory, but these other cultures, this is thousands of years old systemic things, mm-hmm. and and we're like, well, just change. <laughs> like, it doesn't work like that. Right. The fact that we were changing at the rate we are, which is in the history of mankind, is staggering, staggeringly quick, and it, it's kind of good. Yeah. In some regards, but other things you're like, whoa, <laughs> right. what are we going on that thing? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Come Lord quickly. Oh yeah, before the second trial. Yeah, please. <laughs> before the appeal. Oh my gosh. Uh, I, I 
this will, again, this is a very weird thing, this due process thing. Very American. Very American. Or Western. Yeah. Western. Due process. Um, Innocent until proven guilty is a very American thing. Yes. Like, the null hypothesis yeah. is you're innocent. <laughs> oh, you're such a dork. I know, but <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> It also fits with the gospel. I told you this. So with the null hypothesis, all you can do is either reject or fail to reject it. Uh That's the only thing. You can never accept the alternative. Right. Same thing with Jesus. (laughs) You can reject or fail to reject. There is never an accept, which is why we get all the, I accepted Jesus into my heart. Bull. (laughs) So what you're saying is Jesus would have passed your stats class? Uh, he, I, I think it just reinforces that we're on the right path with this thing. Awesome. All right, that's a good place to stop. We'll, we'll talk to you guys next week.